sit down. Take your Bible. Romans six. Romans chapter six. As we're looking through this chapter, we've been talking about victory over sin. We're talking about sanctification. We're talking about how that comes to us on our behalf through the work of Christ, the work that he accomplished for us on the cross. In verses 12 to 14 that we studied last week, we build on the idea of presenting ourselves to God, our members, the members of our body, those individual body parts, to set them aside to his disposal, that they would be consecrated to him for his glory and for his use. Now as we move into verse 15, we begin a new paragraph. He begins, as he's began other parts of this chapter, with a question. It's very similar to what he's already in the, asked in this chapter concerning grace. You know, sometimes grace is disgraced. It can be disgraced when we as individuals or as churches fall guilty of legalism. That leads to bringing disgrace on grace. Or grace can be disgraced when we go into an antinomianism uh, against the law. We're not against the law. We're not under the law, but we're not against the law. Christ came to fulfill the law. And so we seek to truly understand this, that grace might truly be grace. And so he's asking these questions concerning grace, and he says in verse 15, what then? Are we to sin? Are we to continue to live in sin? To go on sinning? As he's already asked in this chapter, because we are not under law, but under grace. By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as an obedient slave, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, who once were slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as a slave to impurity and lawlessness, which leads, notice this, how sin always builds, leads to more lawlessness. So now, present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. There's a lot in this paragraph that we just read. It talks about slavery. In the ancient world, slavery was a very common thing. These people saw slaves, they knew slaves, they were slaves in their church. To us, it's not an economic system we understand very much at all. It's a horrible system. We're not going to talk much about slavery today, being a slave. There are many types of slavery, isn't there? Many types of slavery. And he builds this contrast of being either a slave to sin or a slave to God, a slave to righteousness. Would that it would be that we were slaves to righteousness, that we lived that way. We're not going to go there this morning so much today. As I was studying on this, a lot of times I'll refer to several different commentaries. One of the commentaries that I really like is a commentary by a guy named D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, pastor in Westminster in London in the, in the 40s, 50s, great guy, great commentary. 
he drew my attention into a different direction than I thought I would go reading this paragraph. And he drew my attention to the phrase or the verse in verse 17. And he talked about the importance of this verse. And I didn't even read the rest of his commentary on it because I didn't want to spoil my thoughts with his thoughts. And so I didn't read the rest of the commentary, but it took me down the rest of the road where I want to go this morning. And then next week we'll come back and we're going to finish up this chapter and begin to move into chapter 7, thinking about being a slave, being a slave to righteousness, being a slave versus being a slave to sin. But Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in verse 17 pointed something out that I almost missed. Notice what he says. Thanks be to God that you who once were slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. Then notice this phrase, to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. To the standard of teaching. Some translations, mine is the ESV, some, some translations say to the form of doctrine. To the form of doctrine. And so here the apostle is drawing their attention to the fact that they were committed to a certain form or standard of doctrine, standard of teaching, and that that standard of teaching, that form of doctrine that they had been taught, that they were committed to, was instrumental in producing fruit in their life. There are other forms of doctrine out there that don't produce sanctification. There are other standards of teaching out there that don't produce the fruit that brings forth godliness, that brings forth obedience. But Paul is saying that the standard of teaching, the form of doctrine that he presented to them was the instrumental cause that produced in them good works. So I want to think about that this morning, the form of teaching. Now let's just wade into the text for a minute and just think about this phrase, the standard of teaching. Now, what are, you know, sometimes the word doctrine sounds really dry. We talk about doctrine and people are like, oh, it's dry, ugh. No, doctrine is vital. The doctrines that we believe. Now, what I want us to think about this morning is whenever we see the word doctrine, this is what that word means. It comes from a Latin term, which just means to teach. In a general sense, in the Latin mind, they would think of it as a doctrine as anything that was being taught. Not just church teaching, okay? When we think about it, we think of it as the central teachings of Christianity. And some of you squirm at the word I use there, as embraced by the Catholic faith. Now, when I'm using the word Catholic, I'm using it not in the sense of putting an adjective in front of it, Roman. I'm just using it in its traditional sense of saying the universal church. Okay. The doctrines of the church. The central teachings of Christianity. You know, there are many different streams of the Christian church, aren't there? Um, within orthodoxy, within orthodox Christian teaching. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes and talk about some of the different ones. But even if you look at the big picture and you look at all the distinctions, you're still going to come back and say there are certain doctrines that are embraced by all that are central to what it means to be a Christian. The central teachings of Christianity as embraced by the Catholic faith. By the way, those two definitions come from Webster's Dictionary, not the current one, but from 1828. That's why I put them in there, because that's what the word means. When we talk about doctrine, we're not just talking about you know, a, a book of doctrine. We are talking about the teachings of the Christian faith. That is why when you see it translated, the word, the Greek word translated in the Bible, sometimes it's just translated 
In most of the newer translations, it's just translated with the word teachings. Whereas in other translations, it might have said doctrine. So some translations would say here, in this verse, verse 15, that they were committed to a form of doctrine. Whereas this one says to a standard of teaching. Think of the word form. You form up concrete. You use a form. It's the standard that sets the plum in the square. It's the standard. It's the form. And what he's saying is there is a certain doctrine that is the form of what it means to be a Christian. Now, if you go over and you think about the Greek words, what we're using here, you know, so there's verbs, there's nouns, all that stuff in language. The standard of teaching, teaching is not a verb, it's not an action there, although there are times that the word is a verb. Here, when it is translated this way, it is a noun. It is the standard of teaching. It is a thing. Now, doctrine. Think of the word doctrine. Think of a word that we use sometimes today, and we always use it in a bad sense. But really, if you think about what the word means, it's not a bad word, because it's conveying this doctrine. When someone is indoctrinated, what's happened? They've been taught. That's what the word simply meant. To be indoctrinated meant to be taught. To be, have doctrine, the teaching in you. To bring it into you. To indoctrinate someone. Now we always use that in a bad sense. Like, you know, you shouldn't indoctrinate someone. But that's really, the word means to be brought into the doctrines. The teachings. And so we're talking about curriculum. We're talking about content. The curriculum of the Christian faith. You know, Jesus said in Luke's gospel, everyone who is fully taught will be like his teacher. Everyone who is fully taught will be like his teacher. When we think about content, the content of the faith, it is vital that it conforms to the standard the standard of teaching that was set by God. Now, there's another thing. Notice this in this phrase. It's really interesting how this is worded. You were obe came obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Notice the way he, he words that. He doesn't say there the standard of teaching that you committed yourself to. He says, you were committed to it. It's passive. You were committed to it. Now, the word commit there is an interesting word. The word itself is a Greek word, paradidomai, which means to be delivered to. It is always used in the New Testament for an official action of the church. For instance... It's used in the Gospels and in Corinthians to speak of a process of binding and loosing that the church does. 1 Corinthians 5. Paul says to the church, there's a man who has been guilty of an incestuous relationship. He is unrepentant of it, and everybody in the church is glorying in it. Paul says, when you gather in the name of Jesus, you deliver that man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his soul may be saved on the day of Jesus Christ. You deliver him. The official action of the church to bind to that man his sin and to deliver him to Satan for the destruction of his physical body in order that his soul may be saved. It's an official act of the church. Now think, think about the seriousness of church discipline. When the church disciplines someone, what they are doing 
is they are officially asking God to remove from that individual a hedge of protection and to put them in Satan's hand. That's what's happening, to deliver that person to Satan. It's an official action of the church. Same word that's used here. Now, what he's saying is this, that the church took these believers, these new believers, as they've been baptized and come into the church, and they delivered not only the faith to them, but they delivered them, the person, to the faith. That is why, the way, in some church traditions, there's this sacrament they call confirmation, confirming someone. It is a recognition that someone has had the faith delivered to them, and they are delivered to the faith. They call it confirmation. We don't practice that as a sacrament in any way, but, you know, we do this ongoing discipleship teaching function whereby we are continually delivering to each other the truth of God, hoping that we are delivered to it, and seeing the fruit of, our, of it in our life. But what Paul is talking about here is that the church has a responsibility of taking the new believer and delivering them to the faith, to bringing them in contact to the faith. Now think about that in a sense, because this is an important thing, the way he words this. It's like the standard of teaching is the immovable thing, and the person comes to it. And he's really picturing something there, that the teaching never changes, from century to century, from church to church, from place on the planet to place on the planet. It's the same teaching. People are brought to it. It's interesting to me. I've been reading these devotionals. I think I've told you that before. before ben gave me this devotional a year ago on the, by the early church fathers. All these things that they wrote 200, 300 A.D., and I start reading these, and I'm like, man, that's the very same thing we're teaching. The very same Bible we're quoting. It's just all the same. It's the same thing. It's the standard of teaching. It hasn't changed. Not in 2,000 years. And we deliver people to it. Now, why is this all important? Why are we thinking about this? Let's think about the important application here. The important application is this. There is a standard of teaching. There is a standard of teaching. The church does not just say to anybody and to all, let every man do whatever is right in his own eyes. We don't just allow people to teach willy-nilly whatever they may think. No, the church has a responsibility to hold people to a standard of teaching and to say this is God's word and this is truth and we're not deviating from it. And this is what we teach. Which then led... Think about it. In church history, this led to, be, to those type of things, those forms of teaching being written down. That's why we have creedal statements. That's why we have confessions of the faith. Why? Why do we have a doctrinal statement as a church? Because to us that is important. That we hold to that standard of teaching. Now, in Jude 3, verse 3, Jude, who was a half-brother of Jesus, is writing to the early church, and he says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write and to appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That word delivered is the same word we're seeing in this passage, to be committed to, delivered to. What Jude is saying here is this. I wanted to write to you. I was thinking about writing a letter to you just to encourage you to talk about salvation. And then when I look around and see what's going on in the churches around me, Jude says, it forced me instead to have this burden to write to you and to ask you to contend for the faith to stand up for the faith. And he goes on in the book of Jude. He says, because there have been false teachers that have crept in unaware and are leading people astray and are teaching things they should not teach. And so he says, stand up or contend or fight for the faith. Fight for the faith. That's really the word. Contend for it. So as I'm right to you, 
and I am appealing to you to contend for the faith. Now notice this. The faith was a once for all delivered faith. The church didn't make it up. The church didn't write its own rules. It was delivered to the church by the Holy Spirit. Okay? The faith was delivered to the church. The church, so to speak, got it in the mail. It came to the church. And it was delivered when? Once for all. It's not an evolving faith, is it? It's not an evolving faith. Now, as time goes on, there are certain things in church life that morph with the time and morph with place, but not fundamental teachings, correct? The fundamental teachings remain the same. It is once for all delivered. Paul tells Timothy this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and dead at his appearing, he says, preach the word. Remain the same in season and out of season. When it's popular and when it's not, is what he's saying. For there is a time that is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But because they have itching ears, he says, they will heap to themselves teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. And so here again we see this solemn responsibility. I charge you. This solemn responsibility that is put upon the church. Now, that causes us to think about something. You know, there are um, heresies that creep into the church and have crept into the church through the ages. What is the word heresy? This is Webster's Dictionary again. A heresy is a fundamental error in religion. Now, why does he use the word religion? Because there are heresies in other religions, right? I mean, in Islam, someone who doesn't hold to the fundamental teachings of Islam would be a heretic, okay, because they didn't hold to the fundamental teachings. So what he's saying is a heresy is a fundamental in error in religion or an error of opinion respecting some fundamental doctrine of a religion. And so what's a heresy? What is a heretical sect? A heretical sect is someone who deviates from the norm or from the form. Now, having said that, there are all kinds of subsets of teachings within orthodoxy. Some of you come from different streams. There's Reformed churches, there's Baptistic churches, there's Lutheran churches, there's Arminian churches, there's Calvinistic churches, there's Pentecostal churches, there's any number of types of churches that you can think of, right? Where there are various doctrines that are kind of associated with that group. But there again, everyone in that group still is going to hold to those fundamental teachings. The fundamental teachings. What are they? It's very important we understand the differences. That we don't die on hills that we shouldn't die on, but we are willing to die on a hill that we should die on. I find so many times in myself or in the church at large, we are much more willing to die on a hill that means nothing to God than we are willing to die on a hill that means everything to God. Have you ever noticed that about yourself? We'll get some little burn under our saddle or some little peculiar belief that was a part of the way we were raised or that's important to us, and it is our hill to die on, and it means everything to us, and in the scope of eternity and in the scope of the church, it means nothing. But we're going to go out and be a martyr on it. And then there's this teaching over here that means everything. And rather than stand up on it and earnestly contend for it in the public square, we'll shy away from it. No matter what you say or whatever you may think about Amy Conan Bryant or Barrett, I'm not going to, I can't even say her name this morning, that just got not, you know, put in the Supreme Court, whatever you may personally think about her, 
What you got to say about that woman is she is known for something. And that's for being a Christian. And she took heat for it. Now, we are very clear. You're not going to be able to read most of that. I just put them on one screen because I was lazy when I did it. Just copy and paste. So don't worry about reading it. The reason I'm putting up there, these are documents from our documents that I wanted to draw our attention to. This first screen is an overview of the faith that we defend. And there are statements there that are central to Christianity. Those statements are hills to die on. Those things separate people. They separate those who are in Christ from those who are outside of Christ. We also have other things that are just, and you won't read any of them, but these are things that are, I'm going to use a word, and you'll say, yeah, you really are peculiar. These are things that are peculiar to us. Now, they're peculiar to other churches, but this is who we are. When we say these things, some of these things, we're not saying that someone who chooses to do something different in their church is of the devil. We're not saying that at all. We're just saying these are who we are. There is a major difference between a major doctrine and a minor doctrine. Not that anything with the Lord is minor, okay? Everything is important to the Lord. I'm not saying that. The thing about baptism, it's important to the Lord. He has his mind made up. We want to do it the way the Lord wants us to do it. But there are things, like I just said a minute ago, that are not really hills to die on. And we should love others in the body of Christ who may differ on certain things with us, and that's okay. These are things that maybe separate people in different churches and sort people in different ways, but they're not things that distinguish whether or not someone's going to heaven or not. And the two are very different. When Paul is speaking here about a standard of teaching that they were committed to, I believe he is talking about that first slide. Not that all those things were written out that way, but as church history went on and people studied the scripture, people said these are the hills to die on. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. That is a hill to die on. We have one book from God. It was once for all delivered. We're not looking for another one. We're not expecting somebody here to get a vision from God to write a new book. He gave us one. And it's inspired and it's inerrant. The Lord is coming back to rule and reign. We may differ on some of the ways that that's going to unfold. That's okay. But we're all going to agree he's coming back. And when he comes, he is going to judge. And all men will either go to an eternal hell or an eternal heaven. That is the fundamental teaching of the Bible. You can't take that away and have the same gospel that we believe and preach. It is fundamental to it. Now, having said that, there are many different forms of doctrine that are out there. Go with me to Revelation chapter 2. I'm, I'm really not trying to put you to sleep this morning. I hope you're awake. Maybe I should have you stand up and do jumping jacks for a minute. Go to Revelation chapter 2, because now I want to tie this all together. I wanted to lay some groundwork. Now I want to tie it together. And I want you to look, in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, we have seven letters to seven individual churches in Asia Minor. A lot of study on what these seven churches, what that means to the church today and why he chose those seven. They're not the only seven churches in Asia Minor. Why did he choose these seven? What was true of them that caused him to put it in the book of Revelation? But there are things that are in here that are real, really interesting, and I want to just draw this to you. Notice with me, he's writing to the church at Pergamum. I got that out without screwing it up. And look at verse 13. He says, I know where you dwell. 
where Satan's throne is. We think we got it bad? We probably got a lot of demonic hosts in America. I don't know if Satan's throne is here. He says to these people in this location, you live where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name. You did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the doctrine of Balaam. See, this is a different form of doctrine. It's in the church. Very same time frame that Paul is writing in the book of Romans, early church. And he's saying, you have some in your church who are holding to the doctrine of Balaam. What was the doctrine of Balaam? He taught Balak, this is in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers. Remember the guy that got talked to by a donkey? I've done some talking to donkeys, but I've never had a donkey talk to me. He taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now notice on, in, in the church in Thyatira, he says in verse 19, I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, your patient endurance that your latter works exceed the first, but I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. He doesn't name her, but everybody knows who she is, I'm sure. Who calls herself a prophetess, and she is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. I will throw her onto a sickbed. Those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of their work, of her works, and I will strike her children dead. God takes it serious. A different form of doctrine. I don't have the time this morning to go in what these forms of doctrine were. Um, I think it's just interesting to notice that there's always a link, always a link, between idolatry, which is the first table of the Decalogue, and adultery, which is on the second table. You see this constantly. Idolatry and adultery. And these things were coming rampantly into the church through the teaching of the Nicolaitans, through the teaching of Balaam, who put a stumbling block in front of the children of Israel in the book of Numbers, and through a woman named Jezebel, Kind of by a pen name here, I believe that is being given to, although it's not her actual name. But those forms of doctrine are coming into the church. You know, in America today, it is very easy for the church to embrace various forms of doctrine, various standards of teaching that all of a sudden just get crept into the church unaware and yet lead to all kinds of other things like you see in the churches in Revelation. Why is there sexual immorality rampantly taught and gloried in in many churches in America today that are embracing sexually immoral things? Why? Because they first embraced idolatry. Now, having said that, what Paul is saying here, and this is where I want to bring my message to a close, go to Romans chapter 6, is Paul says this, what I am teaching you has produced something. What was being taught in Pergamum and Thyatira produced something. It produced antinomianism, license, and adultery. That was the fruit of what was being taught. If you read 2 Peter and Jude, very same references are made as what we read in the book of Revelation, 2 Peter and Jude, and the very same practices are being um, condemned by both Peter and Jude. Those things are, these things were being produced by teaching. Now Paul says, what I am teaching, the true gospel, produces something. 
there is a fruit. What is the fruit of the truth? Let's just consider it real quickly. What are the elements of true doctrine? Number one, it springs from the heart. Notice what he says in this verse. Thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin and you have become obedient from what? The heart. Christianity is first and foremost a heart religion. It's not a head religion, although it goes into our head. It is a heart religion. It affects our heart. It affects the why, the will, the movings of the human heart. That is why Jesus said, and it says in the book of Hebrews, it was prophesied in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, that when the new covenant comes, it would be written on the heart. It wouldn't just be written on stone tablets. It would be written on human hearts by the Spirit. It is a heart thing. You know, you can force someone to do something. You can force someone to conform to something. And that person may not be changed at all by it. The thing that changes a person's life is when their heart is in it. And so the faith, true doctrine, emphasizes the heart. My heart is deceitful above everything, the Bible says. It is desperately wicked. Who can know it? My heart is sinful and it needs to be changed. And so David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. It is of the heart. The second thing is its fruit is obedience. It's obedience. He says, you obeyed from the heart. Now, we've all seen people obey because they were forced to, right? And parents, there's times to force your kids to obey, right? There is a time to do that. You don't just let your kids do willy-nilly whatever they may want to do. You just say, well, since it's not in their heart to do it, I'm not going to make them clean their room. No. You make them do it. Nevertheless, what he's saying is when the heart is in it, it will lead to a, a, a personal obedience that just flows out of our love. It's an obedience. And so its fruit is obedience. Its character is grace, not law. The character of true doctrine is grace. It emphasizes grace. It doesn't emphasize the law. It emphasizes grace. And its content is the gospel and Christ. That is why it says in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, this is emphasized by John time and time again through those letters. He says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring the doctrine of Christ, don't have anything to do with them. Don't bring them into your house. Don't let them teach. Because it's the doctrine of Christ. It's all about Christ. And that's what we see in these verses. That sanctification comes from the knowledge of Christ and what he did for us on the cross. His death, his burial, his resurrection. That is where sanctification flows from. And so there is a standard of teaching, and the church must hold to it. The church must stand for it and not stand for anything else. And we are not to be gullible. But we are to devote ourselves from the heart to that standard of teaching to which we were committed. And so let's just close in a word of prayer this morning and ask for his blessing on the word. And then what I want to do this morning is as we close, we'll close with a song and then prayer. And then if you can stay, like I said, I want to encourage us, let's just gather in prayer. I don't have any system for doing this per se, except to say, you know, we'll let everybody go that needs to go. And I need to get these cards into the foyer, too. So I'm going to have somebody do that to help me afterwards. Um, and they'll be out there. You can sign these cards. And then any of us who could stay this morning will just kind of, I'll just say, you know, you guys in that place, and then we'll pray. And we'll be dismissed after 15, 20 minutes. But if you come, let's come on up and let's close with a song and with a prayer. Let me pray now while you're coming. And then we'll sing. And then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have given to us a once-for-all delivered faith, and that, Lord, we are to conform ourselves to it. 
Lord, help us to understand and to know what is vital and what is important. And Father, help us to be charitable on issues that are not. Help us, Lord, to devote ourselves to the unity of the faith and to your body. And Lord, help us to always earnestly contend in this world for that which is vital to you. Lord, may we never shrink from that. But may we stand for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing as we close.